a Wikivideo Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Space Shuttle Columbia Disaster On February 1, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated upon re-entering Earth's atmosphere, killing all seven crew members. The disaster was the second fatal accident in the Space Shuttle program after Space Shuttle Challenger, which broke apart, and killed the seven-member crew 73 seconds after liftoff in 1986. During the launch of STS-107, Columbia's 28th mission, a piece of foam insulation broke off from the Space Shuttle external tank and struck the left wing of the orbiter. A few previous shuttle launches had seen damage ranging from minor to major from foam shedding, but some engineers suspected that the damage to Columbia was more serious. NASA managers limited the investigation, reasoning that the crew could not have fixed the problem if it had been confirmed. When Columbia re-entered the atmosphere of Earth, the damage allowed hot atmospheric gases to penetrate and destroy the internal wing structure, which caused the spacecraft to become unstable and break apart. After the disaster, Space Shuttle flight operations were suspended for more than two years, as they had been after the Challenger disaster. Construction of the International Space Station was put on hold. The station relied entirely on the Russian Roscosmos State Corporation for resupply for 29 months until shuttle flights resumed with STS-114, and 41 months for crew rotation until STS-121. Several technical and organizational changes were made, including adding a thorough on-orbit inspection to determine how well the shuttle's thermal protection system had endured the ascent and keeping a designated rescue mission ready in case irreparable damage was found. Except for one final mission, to repair the Hubble Space Telescope, subsequent shuttle missions were flown only to the ISS so that the crew could use it as a haven in case damage to the orbiter prevented safe re-entry. Debris strike during launch The shuttle's main fuel tank is covered in thermal insulation foam intended to prevent ice from forming. When the tank is full of liquid hydrogen and oxygen, such ice could damage the shuttle if shed during liftoff. Mission STS-107 was the 113th Space Shuttle launch. Planned to begin on January 11, 2001, the mission was delayed 18 times, and eventually launched on January 16, 2003, following STS-113. About 82 seconds after launch from Kennedy Space Center's LC-39A, a suitcase-sized piece of foam broke off from the external tank, striking Columbia's left wing reinforced carbon-carbon panels, as demonstrated by ground experiments conducted by the Columbia Accident Investigation Board. This likely created a 6-to diameter hole, allowing hot gases to enter the wing when Columbia later re-entered the atmosphere. At the time of the foam strike, the orbiter was at an altitude of about 66,000 feet traveling at Mach 2.46. The left bipod foam ramp is an approximately three-foot-long aerodynamic component made entirely of foam. The foam, not normally considered to be a structural material, is required to bear some aerodynamic loads. Because of these special requirements, the casting in place and curing of the ramps may be performed only by a senior technician. The bipod ramp was originally designed to reduce aerodynamic stresses around the bipod attachment points at the external tank, but it was proven unnecessary in the wake of the accident, and was removed from the external tank design for tanks flown after STS-107. Bipod ramp insulation had been observed falling off, in whole, or in part, on four previous flights, STS-7, STS-32, STS-50 and most recently STS-112. All affected shuttle missions completed successfully. NASA management came to refer to this phenomenon as foam shedding. As with the O-ring erosion problems that ultimately doomed the Space Shuttle Challenger, NASA management became accustomed to these phenomena when no serious consequences resulted from these earlier episodes. This phenomenon was termed normalization of deviance by sociologist Diane Vaughan in her book on the Challenger launch decision process. As it happened, STS-112 had been the first flight with the ET cam, a video feed mounted on the ET for the purpose of giving greater insight to the foam shedding problem. During that launch a chunk of foam broke away from the ET bipod ramp and 
Hit the SRBET attach ring near the bottom of the left solid rocket booster causing a dent 4 inches wide and 3 inches deep in it. After STS-112, NASA leaders analyzed the situation and decided to press ahead under the justification that TEET is safe to fly. With no new concerns, a further foam strikes. Video taken during liftoff of STS-107 was routinely reviewed two hours later, and revealed nothing unusual. The following day, higher resolution film that had been processed overnight revealed the foam debris striking the left wing, potentially damaging the thermal protection on the space shuttle. At the time, the exact location where the foam struck the wing could not be determined due to the low resolution of the tracking camera footage. Meanwhile, NASA's judgment about the risks was revisited. Linda Ham, chair of the mission management team, said, rationale was lousy then and still is. Ham and shuttle program manager Rhonda Temor had both been present at the October 31, 2002, meeting where the decision to continue with launches was made. Post-disaster analysis revealed that two previous shuttle launches also had bipod ramp foam loss that went undetected. In addition, protuberance airload ramp foam had also shed pieces, and there were also spot losses from large area foams. Flight Risk Management In a risk management scenario similar to the Challenger disaster, NASA management failed to recognize the relevance of engineering concerns for safety and suggestions for imaging to inspect possible damage and failed to respond to engineers' requests about the status of astronaut inspection of the left wing. Engineers made three separate requests for Department of Defense imaging of the shuttle in orbit to determine damage more precisely. While the images were not guaranteed to show the damage, the capability existed for imaging of sufficient resolution to provide meaningful examination. NASA management did not honor the requests and in some cases intervened to stop the DoD from assisting. The CABE recommended subsequent shuttle flights be imaged while in orbit using ground-based or space-based DoD assets. Details of the DoD's unfulfilled participation with Columbia remain secret. Retired NASA official Wayne Hale stated in 2012 that, activity regarding other national assets and agencies remains classified and I cannot comment on that aspect of the Columbia tragedy. Throughout the risk assessment process, senior NASA managers were influenced by their belief that nothing could be done even if damage were detected. This affected their stance on investigation urgency, thoroughness, and possible contingency actions. They decided to conduct a parametric, what-if, scenario study more suited to determine risk probabilities of future events, instead of inspecting and assessing the actual damage. The investigation report in particular singled out NASA manager Linda Ham for exhibiting this attitude. In 2013, Hale recalled that Director of Mission Operations John C. Harpold shared with him before Columbia's destruction a mindset which Hale himself later agreed was widespread at the time. Even among the astronauts themselves, much of the risk assessment hinged on damage predictions to the thermal protection system. These fall into two categories, damage to the silica tile on the wing lower surface, and damage to the reinforced carbon-carbon leading edge panels. The TEEPS includes a third category of components, thermal insulating blankets, but damage predictions are not typically performed on them. Damage assessments on the thermal blankets can be performed after an anomaly has been observed, and this was done at least once after the return to flight following Columbia's loss. Before the flight NASA believed that the RCC was very durable. Charles F. Bolden, who worked on tile damage scenarios and repair methods early in his astronaut career, said in 2004 that damage prediction software was used to evaluate possible tile and RCC damage. The tool for predicting tile damage was known as Crater, described by several NASA representatives in press briefings as not actually a software program. 
but rather a statistical spreadsheet of observed past flight events and effects. The crater tool predicted severe penetration of multiple tiles by the impact if it struck the TEEPS tile area, but NASA engineers downplayed this. It had been shown that the model overstated damage from small projectiles, and engineers believed that the model would also overstate damage from larger spray-on foam insulation impacts. The program used to predict RCC damage was based on small ice impacts the size of cigarette butts, not larger SOFI impacts, as the ice impacts were the only recognized threats to RCC panels up to that point. Under one of 15 predicted SOFI impact paths, the software predicted an ice impact would completely penetrate the RCC panel. Engineers downplayed this, too, believing that impacts of the less dense SOFI material would result in less damage than ice impacts. In an email exchange, NASA managers questioned whether the density of the SOFI could be used as justification for reducing predicted damage. Despite engineering concerns about the energy imparted by the SOFI material, NASA managers ultimately accepted the rationale to reduce predicted damage of the RCC panels from possible complete penetration to slight damage to the panel's thin coating. Ultimately the NASA mission management team felt there was insufficient evidence to indicate that the strike was an unsafe situation. So they declared the debris strike a turnaround issue and denied the requests for the Department of Defense images. On January 23rd, Re-entry checklist procedures. Weather forecasters, with the help of pilots in the shuttle training aircraft, evaluated landing site weather conditions at the Kennedy Space Center. All weather observations and forecasts were within guidelines set by the flight rules, and all systems were normal. The orbiter was upside down and tail first over the Indian Ocean to an altitude of 175 miles and speed of 17,500 miles per hour when the burn was executed. 8 2 minute, 38 seconds to orbit burn during the 255th orbit slowed the orbiter to begin its re-entry into the atmosphere. The burn proceeded normally, putting the crew under about one-tenth gravity. Husband then turned Columbia right side up, facing forward with the nose pitched up, as Columbia descended. The heat of re-entry caused wing leading edge temperatures to rise steadily, reaching an estimated 2500 F during the next six minutes. Colon this was recorded only on the modular auxiliary data system, which is similar in concept to a flight data recorder, and was not sent to ground controllers or shown to the crew. Columbia began a banking turn to manage lift and therefore limit the orbiter's rate of descent and heating. The wing leading edge temperatures usually reach 2650F at this point. The orbiter's wing leading edge typically reached more than 2800F at this point. The superheated air surrounding the orbiter suddenly brightened, causing a streak in the orbiter's luminescent trail that was quite noticeable in the pre-dawn skies over the west coast. Observers witnessed four similar events during the following 23 seconds. Dialogue on some of the amateur footage indicates the observers were aware of the abnormality of what they were filming. Off-scale low is a reading that falls below the minimum capability of the sensor, and it usually indicates that the sensor has stopped functioning. 
due to internal or external factors, not that the quantity it measures is actually below the sensor's minimum response value. Colon witnesses observed a bright flash at this point and 18 similar events in the next four minutes. At about this time, the orbiter shed a thermal protection system tile, the most westerly piece of debris that has been recovered. Searchers found the tile in a field in Littlefield, Texas, just north northwest of Lubbock. Crew Survivability Aspects In 2008, NASA released a detailed report on survivability aspects of the Columbia reentry. The crew would have had less than a minute between the beginning of orbiter disintegration and depressurization. The structural failure of the left wing set off alarms in the cabin. Although they had no way of knowing that the wing had broken apart as the rear of the orbiter could not be seen from the cabin. All evidence indicated that the crew frantically tried to regain control of Columbia as it began to spin out of control. But the loss of the left wing caused the orbiter to yaw to the right, exposing its underside to extreme aerodynamic forces, and causing total structural disintegration. The crew cabin separated from the rest of the orbiter and rapidly depressurized, which would have killed or incapacitated the astronauts within seconds. Afterwards, the cabin spun around at high RPM, which caused the seat restraints on their upper bodies to fail. They were thus whipped around violently and pummeled by flying and falling objects from the disintegrating cabin, along with their heads and necks being slammed against the helmets, which were not designed to provide any head protection. Even if the cabin had remained structurally intact and reached a lower altitude where air could refill it, the high altitude depressurization would have been fatal to the astronauts unless they received medical attention within five minutes, approximately the amount of time it would take between cerebral hypoxia and brain death. After cabin disintegration, the astronauts' bodies were released into the upper atmosphere and battered by extreme aerodynamic forces and temperatures. The remains of the crew then fell some 200,000 feet to Earth, where they were also subjected to burning from aerodynamic heating. The official NASA report omitted some of the more graphic details on the recovery of the remains. However, Witnesses reported various gruesome finds such as a human heart and parts of femur bones. All evidence indicated that crew error was in no way responsible for the disintegration of the orbiter, and they had acted correctly and according to procedure at the first indication of trouble. Although some of the crew were not wearing gloves or helmets during re-entry, and some were not properly restrained in their seats, doing these things would have added nothing to their survival chances other than perhaps keeping them alive and conscious another 30 or so seconds. Presidential Response At 14.04 EST, President George W. Bush said, This day has brought terrible news and great sadness to our country. The Columbia is lost. There are no survivors. Despite the disaster, Bush said, the cause in which they died will continue. Our journey into space will go on. Bush later declared East Texas a federal disaster area, allowing federal agencies to help with the recovery effort. Recovery of debris More than 2,000 debris fields were found in sparsely populated areas from Nacogdoches in East Texas, where a large amount of debris fell, to western Louisiana and the southwestern counties of Arkansas. A large amount of debris was recovered between Tyler, Texas and Palestine, Texas. One debris field has been mapped along a path stretching from south of Fort Worth to Hemp Hill, Texas, as well as into parts of Louisiana. Various notable places that had debris included Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches and several casinos in Shreveport, Louisiana, along with pieces of the shuttle and bits of equipment. Searchers also found human body parts, including arms, feet, a torso, and a heart. In the months after the disaster, the largest ever organized ground search took place. Thousands of volunteers descended upon Texas to participate in the effort to gather the shuttle's remains. According to Mike Kionai, project manager of the Columbia Research and Preservation Office, these people put their life on hold to help out the nation's space program, showing what space means to people. NASA issued warnings to the public that any debris could contain hazardous chemicals, that it should be left untouched. Its location reported to local emergency services or government authorities, and that anyone in unauthorized possession of debris would be prosecuted. Because of the widespread area, 
Volunteer amateur radio operators accompanied the search teams to provide communications support. A group of small adult Cenohabditis elegans worms, living in petri dishes enclosed in aluminum canisters, survived re-entry and impact with the ground and were recovered weeks after the disaster. The culture was found to be alive on April 28, 2003. The worms were part of a biological research in canisters experiment designed to study the effects of weightlessness on physiology. The experiment was conducted by Cassie Conley, NASA's planetary protection officer, debris search pilot Jules F. Mia Jr., and debris search aviation specialist Charles Krennic died in a helicopter crash that injured three others during the search. Some Texas residents recovered some of the debris, ignoring the warnings, and attempted to sell it on the online auction site T-Bay, starting at $10,000. The auction was quickly removed, but prices for Columbia merchandise such as programs, photographs and patches went up dramatically following the disaster, creating a surge of Columbia-related listings. A three-day amnesty offered for, looted, shuttle debris brought in hundreds of illegally recovered pieces. About 40,000 recovered pieces of debris have never been identified. The largest pieces recovered include the front landing gear, and a window frame. On May 9, 2008, it was reported that data from a disk drive on board Columbia had survived the shuttle accident, and while part of the 340 megabytes drive was damaged. 99% of the data was recovered. The drive was used to store data from an experiment on the properties of shear thinning. On July 29, 2011, Nacogdoches authorities told NASA that a four-feet diameter piece of debris had been found in a lake. NASA identified the piece as a power reactant storage and distribution tank. All recovered non-human Columbia debris is stored in unused office space at the Vehicle Assembly Building, except for parts of the crew compartment which are kept separate. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like